Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast will include mature themes and scenes. This actual play uses the Delta Green Role Playing Game rules by Arc Dream Publishing. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., which may bear resemblance to entities living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your hand. You're all cordially invited to a night at the opera. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am your handler this evening, Michael Diamond, and I have brought together a group of agents because we are going to play some Delta Green. And so, as I like to do at the top of the show, I'd like to thank you, the listener, and especially our Patreon supporters, as this game is made up entirely of backers of the show. And so, I'm going to turn it over to introductions past that to my right. Hi, this is Allie, and I'm going to be playing an FBI agent. Mm. FBI agent... Jennifer Taylor. Thank you for identifying yourself, agent. I appreciate that. Uh, To Ms. Taylor's right. Hi, everyone. I'm Heather. I'm going to be playing a Dow Chemical Scientist named Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. And to Sandy's right. Hello, everyone. It's Nate. I am playing Ethan Moffat, a deputy U.S. Marshal with the U.S. Marshal Service. Fantastic. And last but most certainly not least. Hi, I'm Jim, and I'm going to be playing a computer scientist by the name of Lucas Rosenberg. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. I appreciate that. So we are going to lift the curtain tonight on Chicago. The year is 1999. It's a, we'll just say a brisk fall in 1999. A little bit before the turn into the new millennium, Chicago is a bustling city with all sorts of interesting things going on. But unbeknownst to all of the people around, there are four agents who are very carefully making their way to a specific point on our map. And that point is O'Hare Airport. Each one of them received a message. It could have been by phone. It could have been by courier. Or it might even have been a note slipped into their pocket at a local bar. But they've all been made aware that someone, a contact within the conspiracy known as Delta Green, is looking to speak with them at the airport bar called Cheers. So Cheers is sort of a cookie cutter national chain place, right? Got all sorts of licensed national television series sort of tchotchkes on the wall. Logo branded t-shirts, baseball caps are for sale there. There's all sorts of stuff that just make this quintessentially a national chain. And you've all been given a message to arrive there around one in the morning. Now, our field agents are aware of one another in a a fairly light way. You've never actually worked together, but you have operated in the same area. And sometimes some of you have communicated to one another. And so what I'd like to do is ask the players how they may have had some sort of contact with one another to help us build this internal web within the cell itself. And so I'm going to ask Nate to tell me how he knows Mr. Rosenberg, a computer scientist. How did you meet him? What was your first interaction? Like something like that. What ties you to him in some fashion? Tricky. Mr. Rosenberg, just stop me if any of this doesn't fit with how you want to be a computer scientist. I'm fine with it. Ethan is employed by the federal government to 
track down fugitives of the federal system. There was a case a few years ago. It was a computer crime case, but mostly it was a financial thievery case involving several linked and disparate banking systems. To do this correctly, of course, I needed to secure the proper warrants and the proper authority to access computer records uh, with several banking systems. Within the United States, not a big deal, but there were a couple outside the United States. Luckily, Ethan did have Mr. Rosenberg's contact information in his file. I called him up. I let him know what I was working on, and then I dropped a couple salient uh, points that I felt Mr. Rosenberg would quickly recognize and, and understand the severity and the special nature of this case that I was dealing with. The currency involved a little bit unusual, a little bit out of the ordinary. And it was a quick relationship, but over the course of maybe a couple of days, uh, some back and forth, I was able to gain access to a couple of records given Rosenberg's help and assistance. I don't think we ever met in person. I don't know if I've ever seen your face, but I definitely appreciated the help that one time. And there was... I'll say, a van load of school children that also greatly appreciated that help. So thank you for your service to your country, Mr. Rosenberg. Fantastic. Okay, so there's one leg of our internal web. Um, I'm going to ask our FBI agent, Ms. Taylor, to tell the audience how she is connected to Miss or Mrs. Bodine. Chances are that when I got my upgrade from agent to special agent, it was because I helped uncover someone who was trying to smuggle out chemicals. And Sandy was the point of contact, my whistleblower, without actually being revealed as the source. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. That's fun. So let's stretch a little bit. We'll ask you, Sandy, how are you connected to Ethan. So, a while back, I was approached by someone at the CDC in Atlanta to analyze some samples and give a really quick turnaround on these samples and to not ask any questions about this. I did my best with these samples. There was stuff in this I couldn't even identify, but I did my best with this. Really strange scrapings, organic could never really got to the bottom of what it was, but I gave him all the information that I could. Um, and interestingly, I now recognize that as Ethan here. While the group doesn't necessarily have the opportunity to do any sort of pre-arrival scouting as a group, you'd all have the opportunity to do so on your own. So I'll just ask in the briefest of terms then, getting that note getting that message to meet at an airport bar at O'Hare at one in the morning I just ask is anyone taking any specific precautions before they arrive trying to arrive super early stuff uh, Lucas would probably arrive at least an hour ahead of time I would have checked uh, what the incoming and outgoing flights look like try to He'll aim to look as though he's arrived to collect someone. He's going to hang around in the arrivals area, stretch his legs over towards where the bar is a couple of times, maybe try and discreetly get an idea of if anyone's sat there for quite some time, but mostly try and avoid looking like he's attempting to be anywhere other than the arrivals lounge for now. Certainly. Flying casual. Makes sense to me. Sandy will actually buy a ticket just in case she needs to get on the other side of security for some reason. She'll get there about an hour early and just go ahead and go in the bar. Makes sense. Ethan? I'm in the airport security lounge. I'm talking to a couple compatriots there. I'm watching the feed that has a good image of cheers about an hour before midnight. Just watching to see who might show up. I've got coffee. And I'm sort of casual. I'm just sort of chatting a couple of the other the security officers there. I know one of them by name. And I'm watching the screen. I might see Sandy show up. I might not. Depends on if I recognize her. But making a note of who's there, who's not. I do probably notice this computery hacker-looking 
fella who's set up a, a spot and is very obviously casing the joint. And then I'll, about 12.45, I'll wander over there, keeping the same coffee in a mug with me as I stroll through the airport. I'll wave at a couple people as I go through and look around. I'll give a nod, a very obvious nod to Sandy, and then I'll take a seat at the bar. Question for the handler? Yes. I have a physical description of Sandy. Do you want me to go ahead and give it? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic opportunity, really, for everybody to do that. But please, Sandy, lead us. Yeah, she's 5'5", fair-skinned, green eyes. She's got a heart-shaped face, white blonde hair. She wears casual clothing. She's carrying a briefcase. And if you look at her really closely, once you get closely, you notice she has scattered tiny scars, teeny tiny scars all across her face, arm, and hands. So, since we've spotted uh, Mr. Rosenberg in the bar, why don't you give us an idea? What's his general description, other than the, as before mentioned, the clearly uh, hacker logo that he wears across his chest, which is why he's so easy to to notice. So, Lucas is about 5'7", very skinny, pale, does not see the sun very often. He's wearing what I'm sure he believes is a very cool trench coat type of thing, which theoretically would make him nice and incognito if he actually did it up. Underneath, there's just corporate t-shirts, computer stuff. Right there, he looks like he's a bit of a Next fanboy. So he's wearing a a Next Step, Open Step t-shirt. That is fantastic. Ethan, I, I have to ask, as a deputy marshal, are you openly showing your badge or are you keeping that closed up in a wallet somewhere no it's closed up as a deputy u.s marshal with a little bit of seniority my hair is about an inch and a half long i wear it long as is my right with my tenure here I'm about 5'11 brawny uh, but more acrobat brawny than football player brawny and i've got light brown eyes dark brown hair gets a little bit lighter in the sun But I've got that Midwestern sort of mix where there's a little bit of European there. There might be some Italian, maybe some Middle East, Northern Africa. It's hard to tell, but allows me to blend into many areas. And people feel comfortable because they can look in my face and they can see something that they normally and usually will relate to. All right, then, uh, Agent Taylor. I am sure that I have someone just drop me off at the airport. I'm going to walk in. I'll make it to the bar like five minutes before I'm supposed to be there at one. And I'm dressed very sharp. I've got nice pants on that are loose enough that I can chase somebody down if I have to. And I have a white shirt and I have just a black blazer. I have my gun and I have my badge. She made sure to point out that she has her gun, just so that we're all clear. Okay, so roughly about a minute or two before one o'clock, a gentleman walks in who is, we'll say, 5'11", brown hair, brown eyes, clean-shaven. He's wearing a polo and some dad jeans with a pair of simple brown shoes on, right? They're probably a pair of bass shoes that were picked up a couple of years ago that maybe accidentally get used to mow the lawn twice a year. He walks into the bar. He says something to one waitress who's working at this hour, just whispers something in her ear as he's heading towards a table, and then he makes direct eye contact with you, Agent Taylor, and steps towards a table near the back of this disgustingly Boston-bricked restaurant. I mean, if the interior of this place could turn your stomach, it would have. It's a mouthful of typecasts that's gone on in here. And he sits down, facing the rest of the room, and folds his hands in front of him. Well, since I never sat down at the bar, I'm probably going to be the first one to make it over to his table. He looks up and nods, sort of gestures to a seat at the table. No words exchanged. Well, since this is the only the only action going on, I'm going to go join the group. If this is the group I'm supposed to be with, then at least it'll be people to talk to. That's very true. He uh, looks at you, Sandy, and just nods, doesn't say much. Not, he's, he seems to be waiting. Lucas is going to make his way over, just kind of nod in this guy's direction. If he sees a response, 
the assumption is, okay, this person knows me, I'm this is where I'm supposed to be. And he will pull up a chair, turn it round, and sit down, and not look as cool as he thinks. You get a sense when you approach the table and, and you get that sort of affirmation that this person knows who you are and likely is willing to keep important secrets as he just gives you a smirk as you turn the chair around. And I twist my bar seat towards the table and I take out my burner Sony Ericsson. I take a simple picture in plain view. I don't, I'm not hiding this at all. And put the burner back into my jacket center pocket and have a seat as well. He uh, looks across the table at you, Ethan, and says, I appreciate the consistency in your work style, but it's a little dangerous to take pictures, you understand. Maybe, maybe not. Obviously, this phone is yours if this turns out to be what it might be. It is what you think it is, and it's a problem that is going to need to be solved. I'll make this as quick as I possibly can and as concise as I can. Recently, there was a situation that happened in Montana. It's gotten out of control, and some information was passed our way, and now we need you to deal with it. Put simply, the... FBI in Montana is not capable of handling this. And quite frankly, we don't want them to be. We want it solved by our people. You're going to be sent there as archaeological experts. Enjoy your new degree. All you really need to do is find out what's going on and not be exposed. If you can solve it, solve it. We don't care how it gets solved, just that it is. Is that clear? He takes a piece of paper pretty slowly out of his pocket, a folded one, and he unfolds it on the table. Pretty recently, we got some intel came across our desk. And when it did, we got a transcript, a phone call that got made out there to us on a secure line. The message is from one of our friendlies in the area. His name is Gareth. Flips the piece of paper over to you. Something was found near Harleton, Montana. Big Porcupine Creek. Some kind of dig was going on there. We're not really sure what the people are missing. The missing people are only part of the concern. There was a Thorley, Dr. Thorley, who was part of a dig team that was working the area. Thorley went bonkers, to put it mildly. He came back to the dig site after a couple of weeks. I don't have the full details. When he came back, he came back with a shotgun, and his plan was to deal with people. Now... From what I understand, Thorley was dealt with verbally at sight. Somebody calmed him down, got him to talk reason, and then quickly got him into handcuffs and into the back of a squad car. It gets a little stranger here, though. Thorley goes to jail, and then at some point disappears right out of his jail cell. Evidently, there were a couple of inmates who were in with him who saw it happen. That said, though, the FBI is still sitting on the site, and the local PD, county, everybody is off searching for Thorley. Dr. Thorley, by the way. We need to figure out what's going on up there and deal with it. And so goes into his other pocket and pulls out a, a small envelope. These are flight vouchers, pre-booked. Congratulations. The flight leaves at 7 a.m. this morning. He sort of sits back. As he sits back, the waitress drops a fruity drink in front of him. All sorts of fruit coming out of it, and there's an umbrella, a big straw. Oh, some things never change. I just want to make sure that we're clear. Dr. Thorley disappears from his jail cell. You're talking about disappear incorporeal. You're not talking about disappear. He was pulled out of that cell by an insider. To be perfectly honest, Agent, I have no idea. All right. We know he disappeared. We don't know if it was local PD or county PD. Mia yanked him out and then had these other guys in the cell tell a funny story. Unknown. Do we know how long he was in the cell before he disappeared? No, not personally. Do we know what this funny story was from the inmates? Has anyone in the FBI or PD interviewed them, passed that on to us? They may have taken statements from an agent. You'll have to investigate that as a member of the FBI. He smiles. You may need a bit of an outfit change before you go out there. Just saying. I don't know how many archaeologists you know that wear trench coats, but just a thought. 
There is some real scientific stuff that we assume is going on here, too. There's a dig site. That much we know. And it's a legal one. So it's not like it just popped up out of nowhere. What was the agency, again, who originated the dig? Do we know? Uh, From what I understand, the Lewiston Prospecting and Refining Corporation, the corporation. Yeah. Okay, so it's a mining a mining company started the dig? Okay. Yeah, they started the dig a couple of years ago, evidently. And then I heard something maybe true, not true, that they may have used ground penetrating radar. And they found some, I guess what they call irregularities in the ground. And because there's a fair amount of Native American land nearby, they were a little cautious. And so they brought in a college. That's where Thorley comes in. I guess the rest is not history, but just present day stuff that eventually begins to unroll. Do we know what the original plan for the dig was for? I can only I can only imagine the mining company wanted to use the space to mine. So local PD is obviously involved in some way. Do you know if this has been blown up anywhere else or is it just local PD? Helena, Montana, FBI is who you'll actually want to check in with first. You're going there under the auspices that you're specialists with the FBI, if not FBI agents, as it is. Now, he points at Ethan and says, that should be no problem for you. And he turns his finger over to you, Miss Taylor, and said, that should be no problem for you. Don't blow your cover. They have to believe that you're with the FBI. Maybe you don't work directly for the agency, You've been contracted. Whatever play is easiest, make it believable. That won't be a problem. I wouldn't imagine so. Do you have a timeline for this, or we, or should we construct that ourselves? You should be able to construct most of the timeline. What I do know, I'll just give you a few markers. Maybe that will help. What we know is that Lewiston Prospecting got into this around mid-1997. They eventually turned over the site to the college the University of Montana around early 98 we know that the incident began heating up here it's probably sometime I would imagine in August it looks like and then what we know is beginning of September something happened at the site and eventually Thorley arrives with this shotgun. He eventually ends up in custody. And we know that on September 5th, he disappeared from that cell. We get a message from Gareth here on the 8th of September, talking about more people missing. Well, it's about 1 a.m. Our flight leaves at 7. Mr. Rosenberg, you have time to hit that barber and get a haircut. The gentleman you're talking with sort of sits down a little bit, a little deeper into the chair he's sitting at and sips his drink for just a second and says... It's been a pleasure. Good luck. And then stands up and walks out, leaving the travel vouchers on the table. Oh, before I go, he turns around. He leans down into your ear, Ethan, and says, there's uh, something fairly special in Montana. It's a big green box. It's it's uh, Unit 28. It's at a place, a uh, saving store in Helena. Well, that's really good to know. Mr. O, and I'll reach into my jacket pocket. I'll trade you. And I hand him the burner. He takes it. Appreciate it. He pats you on the back and walks out. Alrighty. So, you have about mm, six and a half hours, roughly, until you take off about six hours until boarding begins. What's the the play? Uh, Go back home. Tell my husband that there's been an emergency at a facility in Helena. And I've got to go out there, got to go to Montana real quick before this makes the papers. Shouldn't take long to tamp this down, but I've got to go get this taken care of. That is a fantastic play. I like the idea of that. So, Agent Taylor, what what does your time look like before you take off? I probably, since I work at the local branch anyway, I'm probably just going to go back to my apartment, grab my go bag and give my brother Edgar a call and ask him to look after my cat. 
for a few days. I'm going to be in Montana and I'm not exactly sure when I'll be back. Okay. So I'll follow that up with this question. What are you telling the local branch of the FBI that you work for, what you're doing and where you're going? Or are you? I mean, the other reasonable thing I can do is I work in missing persons and I can try to find an old missing persons case that's in Montana. That'd be interesting. All right, Mr. Rosenberg, um, your time is probably mostly your own, I would imagine. Luke's going to head back to his apartment, pull out the old interview suit, something nice in charcoal gray. He's got several computer systems set up at home, and he's going to be fiddling around with some of those, setting up a couple of little sandbox systems, going to be some timers set up to basically wipe everything in about a week if nothing happens. Uh, He's going to make sure that each of these systems has either a static IP available from outside or it's going to connect to something that can allow him to connect back in. He's going to have a couple of things listening there, ready to run some uh, custom analysis stuff that he has set up on the quiet. He'll drop a note off uh, with his neighbors, uh, with uh, Ben and Janine. Asking, telling them that he's going to be out for a couple of days, leaving a phone number. And if there are any deliveries, please pick them up. And uh, if anyone anyone starts, you know, banging on the door or anything, please let him know. Sounds fantastic. Ethan, what are you telling your locals? I go back to my security office at the airport. I had packed. I brought my stuff. I had an idea. But I do get on the phone. I've been sort of hanging out at the U.S. Naval training base out in Chicago. Navy boot camp, basically. After my last operation, I was on two weeks of mandated R&R, which is code word for be quiet while we try and figure out if everything was done correctly. So I call my CO over there. I let him know that I'm going to head out towards Yellowstone. There's a training operation that I'm going to try and take part in out there. Don't look for me for about a week, week and a half. Everything's fine, but keep my bunk because I'll be back. And uh, if there's any information, whatever, forward it off to my service. And I'll call in every so often. But pretty decent looking, sort of a bouldering, mountaineering, outdoor survival sort of program that I got wind of. So I'm going to take off there. And then I write a couple letters, pen and paper with stamps. And it's 1999. So that's a thing that is almost dead, but still a little bit more active now. One I write out to my daughter, Ellie. If it was 20 years from now, I might text her, but just a a quick little thing. And then another to the home that my stepmom is currently in. Write out a check. I put put that in the envelope and, and prepay a month of care for her. Then I sit and wait for my flight go through my equipment I've got two big bags and I know in a couple hours before I'm going to walk down and talk to the liaison with the airport make sure that my special bags get put on the flight and I'll have access to them in a special way and they're not surprised or concerned if they do any sort of sweeps and and discover what's in them yeah so I guess that is a question I would ask specifically for Agent Taylor and Agent Moffat. I use Agent Liberally there, Ethan. Are you going to utilize or attempt to utilize your, well, your carry licenses to be able to board the aircraft with weapons? Or are you going to stow them like probably smart people would do? Yeah, I'm going to stow mine for sure. You'll have to declare them, obviously, at check-in. But... Just want to make sure we didn't have too many cowboy atmosphere and atmospheric attempts. I'm going to see if the airport can or the airline can put the bag not in cargo, but in. And if they don't, if they can't, that's going to be fine. But yeah, I'm I'm stung. I'm not carrying. I'm not an air marshal. Likely they don't exist yet. Technically in 99, they wouldn't actually come around for a couple more years. After a, it's not 01 yet. It is not. Yeah. It also means that airport security is not the same style that you're used to dealing with today. A little bit more lax, which is why I asked if you were going to attempt a little, we'll just say cowboy diplomacy and, and board with a gun. 
the flight to Montana is long. It is uh, six plus hours. And the tickets you've got are not in any way, shape or form first class or business class. You are flying economy, which is pretty common at this point. Although I am going to introduce a little bit of what I like to call fun into this game by uh, making a roll and seeing if anybody gets randomly upgraded because that can happen. Well, I rolled a 77. So that's not a helpful role for anyone here. You sit in economy for six and a half plus hours plus the time change and uh, can enjoy that wonderful time change from Chicago to Montana. Okay, so yeah, you're still in mountain time. You gain an hour, essentially. Um, So yeah, you land a little bit in the afternoon. We'll say that touchdown is around 2.30. And... You pick up your bags at the airport. I feel great. I slept on the plane. I have a question for our handler. What is the date today? What is the date today? Uh, The date today is October 1st, 1999. You get out into the airport. There is a Muzak version of uh, a George Harrison song playing. This is hell. Fresh mountain air. Should we get a car, y'all? I think we'll have to. You absolutely will have to. Let's see if they've got something like a Jeep. Handler Mike, did our ticket that we were given to us by our other hand, were they in our names? Were they in our cover FBI agent names? How did we fly? So each one of them came with a cover identity. They also come with a, if you don't look too closely at this FBI identification, it probably passes for some sort of FBI identification. Agent Taylor and Deputy Moffat, you would have badges that look like you work for the FBI. And Rosenberg and Bodine would have badges that basically say, you know, I'm some sort of special assistant because you don't necessarily conform to the what the cell believes would be agent norms. I wander over to the Enterprise table. I put down my Gordon Mosley identification. I do not show my my fake FBI credentials, pull out some cash and fill out the simple form and try and rent a 1998 Jeep Cherokee Hunter Green 4x4, not the sport model, or the 1997 Ford Bronco two-door extended. Yeah, you do eventually get a hold of, they pull out, it's not green, it's red. They say that they have red or white, your choice. That's what they can offer you. You do get a 4 by 4 obviously. You manage to get a four-door vehicle, which is super helpful. There's no Broncos here. They've been taken. Which one is it, Agent? White or red? Oh, it's red. We do have a roof rack as well on this Jeep. Okay, agents. You have obtained a vehicle and your luggage. And, of course, in addition, any requisite equipment that you may have brought with. I understand some of you may have equipment lists that you probably brought through. I don't have any problem. We've talked over some of that equipment. Sandy, I imagine when you went home to pack, you packed specific for the trip. Yes, I packed both my plain clothes and my tactical toolkit. All right, agents, where are you off to first? The mountain air is something here, by the way. It's fantastic. Crisp and clean. Yes, and likely to give you a headache soon. We need more carbon monoxide in this. We're supposed to go to the FBI office first, right? Well, it's one possible stop you could make. You could also go to, to Ethan would know, you could go to the green box potentially and look to see what you have there. But yeah, the uh, Helena FBI office is one stopping point for sure. Before we left, folks, our contact let me know that there might be a little bit of gear and maybe a little bit more information for us at a point. I don't know. You've all, have y'all interact with a green box before? I don't know your histories. Sometimes, not less, less common now that things are in such disarray, but sometimes they leave us a little bit of extra to help us with a job. Contact said that uh, we actually have one out here, which is a nice little boon. I'm going to suggest we go check that out first. 
Sometimes it has a little bit of info, a little bit of reconnaissance that the contact didn't know or the handler can't actually tell us. And then I'm all ears after that. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Oh, one thing for the handler, just on that long flight, I packed several copies of the Journal of Archaeological Chemistry. This is not something I normally am familiar with, so to give myself the plausible background of being a uh, chemist who, that's her, what her specialty is, archaeology, and that's why I'm here for this project, so that when we get to the FBI office, that's why I'm here. I read up on that. Probably a good idea. For what it's worth, part of my go kit is a little Atari portfolio. If you've ever seen Terminator 2, one of those things. Several different connectors. In my head, I'm looking as though this might connect to like scanning devices and things. So I have a pair of headphones that'll plug into it, just in case that looks the part. Yes, that's a, that's a fun little toy. We drive off towards the green box. Given that GPS mapping software as slick and as smooth on modern day smartphones isn't available for you, you do luck out that the Enterprise in the airport has outfitted this Jeep with a GPS. And so it does have a local map extendable out a few, you think about 20 miles, give or take, by just looking at the, the device and sort of tapping around on it. This, of course, is something interesting for you, Lucas, because it's a it's a GPS device. It's at least a toy that comes with the car. The car is not so much interesting. The electronic device is. Uh, but that said, getting to the green box is fairly easy. It's not too difficult of a drive. It's about a half mile from the airport, give or take. Uh, it's a store and save. It's about uh, an acre or so of small garage size storage units that are lined up as one after another, much like uh, cookie cutter houses are in suburbia. We've, many of us have seen these storage units. So there's a 15 foot razor wire fence that uh, rings it. That looks like main access to the facility is through an unguarded gate. It's accessible day and night through a keypad code. You can tell the keypad sits there sort of with the green and there's a red light and a green light on it. There's also a rental office outside the gate. And it looks like there's a a 92 Toyota Corolla that sits out in front of it. It's beige. Boring. But uh, it does appear to have someone probably working here at this hour. The gate is not shut, just so we're clear. There is nothing that would prevent you from driving directly into the facility and going to the box itself. So the gate's not gate's not down, it's up. Nope. It's up. It's it's probably one of those storage uh, facilities that the gate stays open during the day and then after the office hours close they close the gate and force people through the keypad. All right, unit twenty eight it is. I'm gonna have a quick glance around to see what sort of cameras and things there are. Presumably there are some for security. There's anything that looks more than I would expect, I will encourage us to drive past where we're going if I see anything like that. Yeah, this is what you would call a easy money sort of a storage place, right? There's a single camera outside the front door of this visitor's office. It points at the parking pad where this, you know, likely still making payments on 92 Toyota Corolla waits the walking space in front. It also probably doubles as being able to watch the uh, driveway in and out of this place. But other than that, there's no big PTZ cameras that sit on security poles that watch every angle here. This is um, calm, quiet, and pretty nondescript. I'm still going to habitually cover the face as we go past the camera. I always do that. So Unit 28 is in the middle of this location. It appears fairly mundane as you drive near it. Are you parking outside of it, down a ways? I think we'll drive up to it and then park. Keep driving past, take a quick scan, and keep driving past a couple units and stop. These are usually pretty safe, but there's no need not to take a few precautions, right? Special agent, 
take a look at this with me? I'm going to have the portfolio open. I've got a card in there, a ham radio thing, watching for any weird signals or anything. Not, not that I'm paranoid, honest. You wouldn't possibly be paranoid. So, Lucas, you're going to stay in the car and look for signals? Yeah, I'm just going to be sort of watching to see if anything spikes on radio EM frequencies. That sounds good. Then I'm going to get out of the car with one of the Geiger counters, try to do a quick read on the door once we get up to it, just in case. I suppose if you'd like to give us a, a Geiger countering roll, I would imagine that's a form of science. Yeah. Uh, 63, so that's probably not... It doesn't hit any of my scores. How about that? So, yeah, slap it against my leg. I don't know if this thing's working. I say it in, in a too loud voice. Ah, I can't get this thing to work. Anybody? Anybody know how to get one of these to work? Lucas will be rolling his eyes. He'll gesture and point at that button, that button, that button. He won't deign to actually verbally explain anything. It's like, it's not hard. Come on. <laughs> you scan around a little bit. Agent Moffat, uh, you approach the door along with your friendly, now local FBI agent. Cautious, but not ridiculous would be in my head. Walking slowly, I'm scanning. I'm looking for activity. I'm looking for anything odd about the box. And the box is on either side, but I'm not on edge. Yeah, it looks as nondescript as the one to the left, to the right, and so on and so on. There's a simple padlock. Nothing too different about the ones, again, to the left or the right. It seems locked up. Pat my pockets for the key. There it is. Oh, yeah. You want to set up on either side, special agent, and then standard breach. I'll unlock the padlock and stepping to the side and let go. And then what is this? Just a roll top door? Yeah, it's just a roll top door. And then I'll pull the door to roll it up and sort of stand to the side against the wall and peek in. You take a peek in after the roll top door comes up. You can hear the corrugated shaped metal rattle as it goes up. Unit 28 is filled with stuff except a rough five by nine open space in the center of it unfortunately unit 28 is also an absolute mess it looks like no one done any sort of work in here in some time but you do notice a couple of things both of you do notice a couple of things to probably prompt you to close the door a little bit and that is some of these items here are definitely we would say out of civilian scope but that said a majority of them a majority of what looks like here looks like it's just a bunch of junk boxes crates looks like somebody may have moved their in-laws out and just had the overflowed stuff they just couldn't find a spot for and so it, of course, all went in sort of this junky space that number 28 has given them to have some sort of spillover. All sorts of stuff here. There's a hutch, boxes, etc. Papers strewn all over the floor. Well, isn't this typical? Is there anything that stands out more than anything else? Is there anything that stands out? In the back of this storage space there's a an almost human sized pile of laundry so one thing Lucas can potentially do is presumably these green boxes would have some sort of radio transmitter on them so that DG can find out if one has been accessed so I can potentially look for that and try and home in on it with the equipment that I have. Yeah, you can go ahead and give me a roll if you'd like. I rolled a 92, so that's not going to do much at all, no matter what the skill is. You think you're picking up some sort of 
EM interference based off the Jeep. Maybe it's just too close. Maybe the the radio got left on, something like that. I'm going to give the all clear to the two in the car, and then I'm just going to duck my head and move in, click on my flashlight, and start looking for something that's not Auntie's old apartment, shaking my head. This is, you know, they call it camouflage, but this is just laziness. Wander about inside the storage unit. When I get up to the door, I'm going to strap on my GoPro, turn it on, just so that we have a recording of what is in here in case we need to come back. Did I need this? Was this in the green box? Take a look through it. Yeah. Uh, this is a pretty fascinating piece of tech for you, Rosenberg. You've obviously seen these things before, um, but it's it's a little neat to see one up close. You look at that and look back at some of your devices and you're like, I wonder if I could, wonder if I have an adapter for that. I bet I do. Am I right in thinking that the agents are going to search this space fairly thoroughly? I'm going to just ask, are you going to do so with the garage door up or down? I just want that for clarity. Down for sure. So there are two cots in this space. They do not have anything piled on top of them. There's a space heater plugged into the a single electrical outlet, the two gang that is nearby. It even has a, a rusty cover plate to boot. A little cardboard box that has two unopened bottles of Jack Daniels. There is also with it a battery operated radio and a flashlight and a note that says compliments of F. So the junk here is junk from thrift stores. There's random pieces of beat up furniture. There's old sporting equipment. So like hockey sticks and ball bats and also a, you think that's a saddle? Maybe a riding saddle for a horse? No idea why that's here. Uh, some broken skis, a couple of unused rackets. And then beyond the dingy clothes, there are a few items which are definitely not from Grandma's Addict. One of them is a fully operational M72A2 law rocket launcher. Uh, there are two Amsel Striker shotguns here, still in their cases, along with 100 rounds of slug ammunition. Uh, there is a note on the shotguns that says, be careful. Ethan, in a box, a wooden shipping crate, a secure one, one that you sniff out fairly quickly, you find 14 thermite grenades. Sandy, at the back there, while you're picking through some of the stuff, just looking around, getting your visual log of everything, you end up uncovering this, by accident, this this pile of laundry. And there is a chest-high sandstone statue of a Sumerian creature. There's a jade star-shaped medallion that hangs around its neck. There's an eye in the middle, which is on fire, and it's been sort of epoxied to the statue. It looks a little crudely epoxied. Um, On the stomach, there's a note card, and it's scrawled in this sort of nasty, quick writing, and it says, do not fucking remove this. Okay. Will not remove it. And there's an arrow point arrow pointing to the medallion. I glance around at my fellow agents and I just repile the clothes back on it. I don't I don't see any reason to tempt fate with this. I just put it all back in place. Let's just let's just follow that. Lucas would seriously want to remove that at this point. But that is essentially the list of goodies that you find left by whoever F was. You're thankful either way that F thought enough to leave a few bottles of booze in case things get difficult. I will leave uh, as a gesture of goodwill to whoever comes next. Uh, Since I've got a couple of packs of cable ties, um, I'll leave a pack of cable ties and a pack of mini flares. Unless there's already something like that here. I'll leave that here. Yeah, you don't see any flares. Okay, mini flares and cable ties. It's about all that they might find useful. Otherwise, the rest of the stuff I've got is going to be in here already. Anybody else taking something from the green box now before you head to the FBI office? I'm definitely taking a couple of grenades unless 
others are taking the rest of the grenades. I mean, we def- we need to leave some here, obviously. But I think we should take the shotguns and some of those grenades. I'm looking at that law rocket. There's hunger in my eyes, but there is no explanation for having that. Or where we're going to keep it. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to the car. I'm going to pull the back of that Jeep in the storage area up. I'm going to grab the, the spare if it's there. It's a rental. It might not even be there. Oh, it's there. It's a spare. I'm going to bungee it to the... You said that there was a, a luggage rack, a roof rack. I'm going to bungee it up there, tie it up there, and then now we have a little space to put some thermite grenades and a couple shotguns and such. Yeah, luckily the shotguns are in box, so you're not forced to just carry them loose. And the box are nondescript. There's no graphics. There's no names. They're just boxes. Um, and, and for point of order, there is one box and the two shotguns are in them. There's a small cardboard divider between the two. And a, um, a thorough agent could probably pack in the 100 rounds of slug ammunition in the same box in the gap spaces as to uh, free up any additional room. And then I'll just tell, you know, we don't need to bring these back. If we don't have any use for these shotguns or these grenades, that'd be great. We'll bring them back, put them back, but at least we'll have them if we need them. All right, then. On to the FBI offices here in Helena. So not terribly far from the green box are the offices of the FBI in Helena. And the drive over is pretty simple. It's a three-story building. It's located on Mercator Avenue, nondescript. And it looks like, for the most part, just walking up to it, locals ignore it. Uh, There's room in the parking lot nearby to park and walk over. And it does look like the parking on the facility proper itself is guarded. And obviously, given the building, there are cameras and... uh, it does, it does appear that the um, entranceway does have a, a short fence, although it's nothing like there's no massive barbed wire. It looks like any other corporate building with a fence and a hedge. Okay, so before we get out of the car, I'm going to ask everybody in the party to give me their aliases so that we know what to call each other before we get into the building. I'm Jonathan Davis. Gordon Mosley. I'm Whitney Donovan. All right, Mr. Davis, what's your cover? I am a field technician. I work usually with cybercrimes unit. And how will that apply to an archaeological standpoint? I'm here because you need someone who can potentially work with uh, any scanning equipment, any newfangled technological things that uh, the archaeological team have been using. Particularly if weird things are happening, folks are kind of worried these days about uh, radiation from cell phones and things. So I, I'm the person who knows about that sort of stuff, can figure out if something electronic is sending people haywire. And I am Agent Irene Greenstone. Let's all try to keep this together, shall we? Before we get out of the car. Just a note, this is when we all find out if this is just a setup or not. If it turns out to be a setup and this is all being orchestrated to get us all together so they can capture us easily, I'm going to gun the engine. I'm going to run straight through whoever is trying to detain us and flip the car around. So you'll want to make note of the of the oh shit straps and everything like that. And if you have weaponry upon you, you might want to loosen it because we'll probably need to shoot our way out. If this isn't you know, all a setup orchestrated to capture us and none of that, you don't have to worry about any of that happening, but... This is it. This is when we have to use these IDs and we find out how well they work. I'm a contractor. I'm a federal contractor. So, uh, Walking up to the building is a relatively simple process. They have a, a turnstile, man-sized turnstile that is available after you get checked in. And so approaching that first gate, there is a plainclothes agent that comes out and asks why you're here. I'm bringing in a contractor and an outside consultant to take a look at the dig site. I walk up to the to the 
FBI guy say, hi, I'm Dr. Whitney Donovan. I'm a contractor with TRI from Washington, D.C. I extend my hand, shake it. I'm an archaeological chemist. We're here to examine, I'm here at least, to examine uh, some of the sites at was Howiston. Oh, Harlowtown. Sure, sure. Yeah, Harlowton. Yes, I'm so sorry. They just gave me the papers last night. Uh, yeah, we need to run some tests, I was told. Yeah, let me get you checked in. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, tons of fun stuff in store for you. <laughs> he, he sort of chuckles. They walk you uh, towards the... Th- basically towards and through the main lobby. Uh, they give you directions. They tell you to stop at the front desk and that you'll get a chance to speak with special agent in charge uh, who... The guy at the gate sort of gives you a grimace in a, in a good way. Sort of says, you get a chance to talk to the Pope. They take your names. They take your identification down. Just looking at it, they write your names down, stuff like that. And then they hand you back your information. The inside of the building looks like an office building. There's nothing special about it here. There's a bunch of people doing paperwork past the reception area. You get picked up by a young lady. She's probably in her mid-twenties. She wears basically business gray uh, with reasonably long enough skirt for government work. A gray blazer, a white shirt buttoned up and she says My name's Cynthia and I'll be taking you upstairs to meet the special agent in charge. Come with me. She lets you know that there's coffee available. You might need it uh, in case and let her know if you need anything as you see her in the hallways here. You get taken up to the second floor and deposited into a small conference room. Bob will be in in just a minute, okay? Then she leaves. In the conference room, are there any ashtrays? Yes. Okay. Have they been used? Uh, they have. Ah, I'm going to go to the ladies' room. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get out my plain clothes out of my plain clothes toolkit i'm going to get my vial of pcp and my half pack of cigarettes i'm going to dip one of the cigarettes in the pcp give it a couple of minutes to dry put it back in the pack and then go back in make a note of which one it is probably a good thing to know so you get back and sit down just in time as a tall we'll say aging Caucasian man walks in, blue suit jacket, same color pants, a lightly striped shirt, solid red tie. He steps in the room with another gentleman in his, uh, just right on his heels. He introduces himself and reaches out and shakes hands with those who are uh, willing. And he says, uh, my name is Robert Pope. Happy to help you. Yeah, shake his hand. I'm a special agent in charge here. This is my lead agent, Russell White. I appreciate you coming out. Thanks for having us, Robert Russell. Gordon Mosley and special agent in charge of our little unit here, our little team, Irene. Greenstone. I hold out my hand. Davis, uh, I'll sit down with a notebook. I'm Dr. Donovan. He shakes your hand. Good to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Dr. Donovan. Well, they shut the door. Russell shuts the door. You see him slowly turn the the blinds on the two windows that are here. And then he flips another switch that's near the, the light switch. And you hear a the sound of air moving above intensifies. And Robert reaches into his jacket and pulls out a pack of cigarettes. Not agency standard, of course, but uh, we're a little far away from D.C., and so the rules are a little different out here for special agents, you understand? Oh, totally understand. He lights up a cigarette. Well, this one is pretty strange. We don't have a lot of resources, unfortunately, for, well, mining and archaeology. So I was happy to hear that someone could be sent out to help us out. The rundown is pretty simple, if uh, a little strange at this point. There was a dig from what we know was going on a couple of years. Lewis and prospecting and refining uh, out of Billings discovered what they believed to be metal deposits. At an area, Big Porcupine Creek, they used ground penetrating satellite called Geostar to find it. That's really all they'll tell us at this point without a court order. 
We know that they lease the site from us, but the terms of that lease do not require them to release information pertinent to their intellectual property. We know by way of a local university, Montana, Helena, that they put a message into them to figure out what these irregularities they'd found were in the ground. We know that Dr. Thorley and a couple of his graduate students, a Franklin Opitz and a Michael Richards, not the guy on TV, of course, uh, made some trip out there. There's about a year to year and a half time difference. So Lewiston sat on this stuff for a while. Either they didn't know what it was or they hadn't really dug in there. Thorley goes out there with a couple of his graduate students and they do some sort of readings as far as we can tell. I'll get into why that is in a minute. They discover these erratics and at some point a Dr. Wilson from the University of Pennsylvania arrives with another team. That's what we think is probably four months ago, five months ago. Wilson and his team begin working the site because evidently Thorley needed some sort of backup. It's at that point things go a little strange, at least as far as we can tell. There must have been some sort of disagreement between the dig teams. Something happened. But we have a police report from Wheatland County that shows that September 3rd, Dr. Thorley showed back up to the dig site with a shotgun. He wanted something from Dr. Wilson. Wilson said that he was erratic, that he was trying to force people to stop digging, and that he was willing to shoot people if they wouldn't stop. Lucky for us, Dr. Wilson was able to talk Thorley down, and Wheatland County picked him up before anybody got hit. So, of course, Thorley goes into the pen for a little while so they can figure out what the situation is. And then I get a report from Wheatland County that two days later, Thorley disappeared. It's only at this point that we have any visibility on the situation. About a week later, they contacted the FBI officially and asked for our assistance. And then when they couldn't figure things out, I guess, I don't know, you all got called out. Agent, is there still work going on at the site or is it shut down at this point? I got two people on site. Nobody's allowed to touch anything. The UPenn folks were wise enough to uh, leave a tent because they were staying on site during their summer work. I mean, during the summer, the weather is pretty nice up there. Nice views. Good place to have camp, all things considered. It's October now, and I don't necessarily... Uh, I can't say draw in lots for being in that tent at in October is as nice as it is in June. Yeah, understood. No sign of this Thorley for the last month? And some, some egghead goes and disappears out of custody. I don't expect him to stay hidden. And that's not really their their expertise is to evade law enforcement. No, I wouldn't think so. I've thought about, I've talked to people in Wheatland County. The sheriff over there is a good guy. He's on the right. There's no way he would let somebody out of a cell. That's not his way. Have been, there been any sightings of him at all since he disappeared? Not a single one. That's very unusual for a missing person, regardless of on the run or not. Is there no video evidence from from the pen? Internal cameras over there in Wheatland County are, well, they count about two. One on the inside of the door and one on the inside of the office. There is a full room of material for you to look at, though, here if you're interested. Absolutely. I did say the case gets strange. Oh, we haven't gotten to the strange yet? There's something more. No. He smiles. Sort of stubs out one of these cigarettes. Lucas leans forward. It's getting interesting now. There were skeletons recovered from the dig site. Six of them. Seven if you count the first one. Was the first one discovered significantly sooner than the others? Well, that's the troubling portion of what we know. This is why you're all here, of course. It isn't just Dr. Thorley that's missing. No one has seen his graduate assistants. The UPenn team is missing. And so you can imagine, of course, the local news is very interested to know where 
seven missing people are. Nine if you count the graduate students. Has anyone run dental checks on any of these skeletons? There's work being done. Understand that that dental records and the checks on them take time. The skeletons were found in a hole in the deep of the earth, 30 meters down. I don't imagine there's dental records from back then. I know sometimes we get loose with language. When you say skeletons, you mean bones? You mean corpses? I mean, skeletons is, that's a lot of work in my experience. How complete? Just bones. You want to see them? Yeah, eventually I think we take a peek at them, yeah. In archaeology, what we when we say we find a skeleton, usually it means it's as a body would be found. A head on top of a thorax with arms and legs. Or were they found as a pile of bones? We have some limited notes. There's more information that the scene is being contained to. We have some of that here, but we have some of the notes from the UPenn team that they made. They mostly found them. And it's my understanding, at least from what I know, that they were found as a body would be found. They were uncovered and brought out of the earth. Intact. They were essentially intact. Well, that's fascinating. Were they able to take photographs? It's all documented in the room. As far as uh, the people who found them, were they able to take photographs of what they found or they just wrote notes? Uh, there's written notes. There are some photographs, but the the skeletons themselves are all here in the office. Right, right, right. I was just curious about the site that they found. OK, that's excellent. No, I, I would be happy to look at whatever you have. That's very kind of you to offer. It'll be done under obviously secure time and secure uh, methods, uh, just so we're aware everybody here is aware if you take a look at the material that we have just understand that it can't leave the office any other questions the question for the handler is is uh agent pope the only one smoking is the lead agent smoking as well the lead agent is not smoking um i'd be happy to give you a human troll if you're interested in in in-depth description there i only have it at 10 it is i'm not even going to try it's just to pick up on something. Well, I'll, I mean, I'll give it a roll, but I, with no estimate of, uh, oh, no. You get the feeling that the lead agent here, Russell White, who's sort of standing behind him near the, the light switch, is not necessarily the hugest fan of the divulgement that seems to be going on. You imagine, anyway, those of you especially... Deputy and you, Agent Taylor, would probably pick up on the idea that this is supposed to be Agent White's gig, and now outside help is being drawn in, and you're not real sure that Agent Russell White is uh, too happy about that. Pope stands up. Uh, As you can imagine, being the Pope has... I have a full dance card, I'll just put it that way. Bet you use that all the time, don't you? Oh, I mean, it's the perks of the name, right? We'll be happy to take a look at what evidence you got here, but uh, sounds like we've got a full dance card as well. Appreciate you bringing in some specialized assistance to deal with the archaeological aspects of this case. Would love to sit down once we get a chance to take our own look and compare some details again, my agent been very helpful and accommodating. I know sometimes it's uncomfortable to have newcomers show up in your house. Well, we're one big happy family, right? One big family at the very least. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Everyone loves working with everyone at the military. Well, I'll leave you with Agent White. He uh, steps out of the room and as Pope leaves, you hear the fan overhead kick off. Would you take us to where all of this has been compiled, Agent White? Agent White sort of folds his hands in front of him. Sure thing. He turns on a heel and steps out of the room and walks down the hallway. Let's go take a look at some bones. So the evidence room is a room about 10 by 20. And there are several places for these trays, which they begin to bring out. So there's a a lab assistant here who gives you an essential rundown of the way you're expected to operate inside their evidence vault, which is look, but don't touch. And if you have to touch, make sure that you're careful about things when you do them. 
If you want to point to something, use a pen, something like that. Just very basic stuff that they try to acclimate you to. This is especially seemed to be driven home to people who are non or seemingly non-federal agents because they're going to make the assumption that agents will know how to act. Uh, They lay out seven trays, right? So each one of these trays is filled with bones and the trays themselves are not very long, but they hold the bones, the thorax, the ribs, etc., the arms, all that they hold on the tray and you see them set out these one after another. And then they give you a tray that has what they are calling irregularities that were found. After they do that, the lab assistant sort of steps back where Agent White is. And uh, they have a very brief conversation about, you know, length of time, etc. And then Agent White says that he'll leave you to it. So a question for the handler. On this separate tray, the irregularities, is that like another pile of bones? It is not, actually. We'll get to the irregularities in a second. As they are laying all this stuff out, I turn to the person who's the head of the lab, say, I need the following items. I need a lab coat. I need a filter mask. I need an entire fresh box of lab gloves. Sure. Size medium. They, they go to a standing closet door and open it up. And I need a set of scrapers. I need a two sets of forceps and I follow behind them with just a list, an entire roster of things that I want to do them to do an exam. All accessible here in the evidence lab. It takes them roughly five minutes or so to go through your shopping list. I'm thinking, man, Sandy got a lot out of those two magazines on that flight. Do you have a T1 line in here? Uh, Not in this room, no, but we do have one in the uh, main part of the office. Lucas is pulling out his little portfolio firing some things up on there so uh just because we'll eventually get to it i'm going to give you some a a detailed list a little bit of what's on the irregularities tray so on the irregularities tray what you're finding are metallic bits of ferrous metal and so you find tiny bits of and by tiny i mean anything from half a pinky sized to maybe two to three inches long of twisted and decomposed metal. You find what you think might be iron. You think what you see, what might look like a, a cap lid to like a bottle. It's twisted. All of the stuff is ugly. It's dirty. It's dusty, obviously, but there's a fair amount of it. They also produce for you in this evidence locker two pieces of wood, mostly degraded. You also get a picture of the 12 gauge Mossberg shotgun that Thorley had. This was uh, looks like a, a picture that was taken by Wheatland County. What do these two pieces of wood look like? Uh, they look like they're driftwood at this point. They're oddly shaped. There's a bit of a, a curve to one piece, but they're eroded pretty heavily. They were taken from the dig site, it sounds like, by the UPenn team. Were they taken from where they found the skeletons or just from the same dig site? That's unclear. Everything that, as far as the lab assistant tells you, is everything was taken from the dig site. Where at the dig site is hard to say. It's a dig site. It's in the middle of nature, so it's hard to say what might have potentially been picked up at the site and seemed deemed interesting at the time. I'm going to ask for all of the photos of the site to be given to me so I can put them all out on a flat surface so I can look at all of them together. These pieces of wood and the odd shape and things, does any of it seem to say um, like an old rifle or something? No, no, it's, it's way too degraded for that at this point. How old are these bones? That is a question for science. I asked the lab manager person, did they, have they done that yet? Have they figured that out yet? We have done a few tests on them originally. Special agent is concerned uh, just that we make sure that any sort of tests that we do are careful. And so right now we're waiting on our results from any sort of carbon dating. Well, that seems weird. So you don't yet know if you're dealing with a homicide or if you're dealing with found remain. You have no idea how old this 
These are? Well, I mean, she, I mean, the assistant looks at them and, and they say, well, from my scientific assessment, they're ancient history. They were found 30 meters down in the ground. And you can tell here, she sort of runs a line across one of the bones. You can tell here that there's evidence of aging here, here, and not that this person spent way too many late nights at Denny's. The aging here is from time. She walks you through. Can I make a biology roll? Certainly. What are you attempting to ascertain? Yeah, see what I can tell from the bones? I don't have forensics, but maybe I can tell something from biology. Yeah, 34 on a 60. Yep, that's success. Uh, So the bones themselves are definitely old. This isn't 100 years. This isn't 200 years. This isn't revolutionary era. This is way older than that. They all have evidence of that same aging. Do they all have teeth? What do the teeth look like? Uh, They do all have teeth. The teeth, they look like they're in fairly good order. Not all of them, but a fair amount of them. They're that old. I wouldn't particularly expect great dental hygiene. Are there any holes in the bones? Like drill holes? Yeah, as I examine it, yeah, look for yeah, look for drill holes, look for broken bones, look to see the male female ratio, that kind of thing. It's probably gonna be a forensics role. I say I don't have anything in forensics, so I can't make the role. So yeah, I'm gonna say it's forensic, so I know that there are more than one person that has forensics. But for instance, I have forensics. You do, and your compatriots or at least your fellow agents are looking around. No. I would not like to do that at an 89 over 30. No, probably not. I have medicine at 20. Can I give that a try? Yeah, I'd, I'd let you do a medicine roll, sure. Okay, let me see. No, 92. Uh, I have no. Okay. Yeah, you look around the bones, look around the, the teeth, uh, that sort of thing. You don't really get a strong pull from any of that. Actually, uh, I have surgery at 20%. That's more the act of surgery, but but I, I'll allow it in this case. Given what we're looking for, yeah. When we're, I'm sure. 29. Uh, what did I say I had? 20. We don't have luck in this one, do we? We do not. Um, so we don't have luck. You were also looking over some of the uh, skeletons to try to assume, to try to figure out sexes and that sort of thing. Uh, Heather, I would just say that it's fairly clear that six of them are male and one of them is female. At the risk of sounding like Fox Mulder, how many men and women were in the uh, dig teams? Well, from so far what you know, Dr. Thorley and two graduate students were the first portion of it. You're unclear as to how many people Dr. Wilson brought with him for from University of Pennsylvania. So that is something that you'd probably want to get an eyeball on. It's your understanding that not all of the paperwork has been brought to the office here, that there is still some active material on site at the dig site in Big Porcupine Creek. Well, these skeletons are ancient. When you say that, Special Agent, are you seeing some link between the skeletons and the missing people? I thought we're just dealing with two different things here. They found some bones in their dig site, which frankly doesn't raise an eyebrow yet. Also, there are nine missing people from this company that's doing research at the dig site. You're not saying these skeletons and the missing people are somehow connected, are you? Well, given the age of the skeletons, would it would not seem so. But given the nature of why we get called in, I am loath to consider any coincidences as just coincidences. Got to go find more information. Agreed. Agreed. I don't think we want to jump to those those conclusions yet. Given the nature of our work, we can jump to all sorts of conclusions all the time. So I agree. Let's find some more some more data, some more facts here before we start putting together these theories. Dr. Donovan, are you wanting to go out into the field? I think we have to. Okay. Have we gotten everything that we've gotten out of this lab? The only other thing I want to do is take a long, hard look at these pictures to see if there's anything 
anomalous between any of the shots that might overlap. Okay, so if you would like to search through the photos, you can. Let's search roll. Okay, I have a 44 under 50. As far as the pictures go, you notice something a little strange at some of the photos that were taken at sight. Okay. One of the things that you notice in some of the the pictures, they're all done on these. The background of these pictures is all against a white table, right? So it's probably some sort of prep table that one of the teams had that they pulled off so that way they could do proper photography of all of the, the pieces. You catch sight of something glinting in one of the photographs on one of the skulls that they took a picture of. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the glint that you're seeing is a gold filling in a molar. Okay. Uh, Dr. Donovan, do any of the skulls have a gold filling? I'll go check. I will go look. Do I see one? You go and look through the skulls. And one of them, be it's marked on the tray uh, as number one, does have a molar that is gold. It's corrupted and old and probably dingy and dirty. This could be from a ton of different things. There's obviously, as a dig site, there's going to be dust. But yeah, absolutely. There is a gold tooth sitting a gold filling that sits back in one of these molars. Are we still being observed by the FBI people? Absolutely. You're being observed by the lab technician. All right. Well, I've got a burner phone, too, so I'm going to take it out and take a photo. Easily enough done. There's four of you and one of them. You can easily sort of stand to the side for just a moment and take a picture. I'm actually going to ask the lab tech if they would be able to take molds of all of the teeth just in case we lose part of the skull. It's something that I'd want to be able to reconstruct if absolutely necessary. And of course, I have an ulterior motive of wanting to submit this as sneakily as I possibly can to try and get a dental match. Sure. You ask the technician and she tells you that she'll bring it up with the special agent and get a timeline for you. I just don't want her or the lead agent to know that I am planning for them to be matched with current people in the system. So Lucas is going to pull out one of his little doohickeys and it's going to look like he's taking lots of photographs of um, one of the skulls, the one with the filling, going around, taking quite a few. He asks the lab tech if they can hold a light directly above it and keep that light there so everything is in sort of like stark shadow. He's going to take a bunch of these, pull out the car, plug it into his portfolio, tap through a couple of things, and he's going to say, okay, T1 line, whereabouts was that, did you say? She directs you towards the office in the middle of the space on the second floor. Okay, so I'm going to head out that way. What I'm aiming to do is upload all of this back to my uh, computers that I've set up back at home, which are going to take all these photos with very good contrast and relief on them and turn them into a uh, as accurate as possible 3D rendering of the skull, primarily the teeth. I'm also, if I get the chance, I'm also going to kick off a couple of programs running back there which are going to try and find they're initially going to go into the UPenn and I forget the other university they're going to go into the university sites try and dig up information on professors who were leading the dig see if it can locate anything on who was which graduate students were coming out with them Um, this is not on the public site this is on this is exploiting some SQL error somewhere to get, to get inside, uh, once I locate some names, I'm going to try and find some dental records from somewhere as well. You stepped hip deep into a long-term computer science role in 1999. So why don't you roll computer science for me first and we'll determine what the next step is. Okay. So uh, that is a 28 under 60. So that's a successful role. You are able to transmit the data back to your private server, you are also able to begin the rendering. 
you know the rendering will probably take about four to six hours given the amount that you've done yes i'm, I'm being generous um it'll take a little while for you to spin up the actual 3d renderings of it while you do that i would like you to make me an intelligence roll That is a 99 over 65. Okay. So a 99 specifically is a critical failure. So while you're transmitting data to one place and trying to get things going with the University of Montana, you realize that there's someone standing over your shoulder. Excuse me, what are you doing? We have tools set up at the home office going to be able to chew through things a lot faster than I can here. And I sort of gesture towards the diminutive little 1980s MS-DOS handheld that is my general thing here. Yeah, I get all that, but that's the University of Montana server. What are you doing? Do you have a warrant for that? I work with the university. I get to use some of their uh, compute infrastructure. You get to roll me persuade is what you get to do. And it's opposed, of course, with human intelligence. (laughs) 92. (laughs) So this agent that works inside the building shakes his head and he turns around and says, Russell, is this one of your guys? And you hear the heavy footsteps of Agent White before he rounds the corner. And uh, White steps over and goes, Terry, what's going on? He goes, are we supposed to be getting into the University of Montana server? That's how this guy's handheld or whatever. It's all over it. So White asks you, yeah, what what are you doing? Do you know where we were sent from? Do you know what organizations we worked with as consultants? He sort of furrows his brow a little bit. As far as I'm aware, you're from D.C., A lot of organizations in D.C. He lifts an eyebrow. And? A lot of organizations in D.C. that that need consultants to work with heavy-duty encryption and, let's just say, secrets uh, of interest to the government. I don't think I'm really allowed to say much more than that. Yeah, funny. The spook shit doesn't work here, buddy. This is Montana, and you're in my office on my case. So cut it out and get back to work. Will do, sir. I'll fold closed the portfolio. Yeah, it's fairly... You pick up likely that Agent White isn't somebody that has any sort of depth or breadth on computer sciences. He's probably just a field agent, but whoever this other person is, they pretty clearly recognize... SQL coding and remote accesses from inside the office. You probably just have to be more careful next time. So back in the room, while this kerfuffle is all going on, is anybody uh, looking at anything else before we make our trip out of the FBI office? Yeah, I want to look at the bottle cap. What kind of drink was it from? Um, So it's bottle cap size and shape. Any sort of identification has been has been okay. removed. Got it. Okay, never mind. It looks like it's it's rusted a bit, but you can definitely tell that there's a significant shape to that. Got it. Okay. So in that irregularities tray, ignoring the skeletons now, I'm I'm, I'm a weapon of war. So I'm looking at the metal bits and the iron and the bottle cap and the wood, and I'm thinking, is this shrapnel? Is this remnants of an explosion? Fire? Are these do I recognize these things as as weaponry? Anything like that? It, it's certainly possible that some of them could be leftover metal from like a fragmentation grenade, uh, but it it could be any number of ferrous metal or metallic objects because of the age of them or the the visual age of them that you're seeing. You would need an actual like forensic analysis on the metal to know more about what it could be. All right. Oh yeah, one question about the skeletons. Is it obvious how they died? You know what? It is not. 
it is not obvious how they died. They all appear to be adult age. There are no children here. What's the next move, agents? So there's a sheriff in Whitley County that we could talk to. There's the actual site itself. Yeah. Uh, what, go talk to the sheriff next, you think? What time is it? It is about 4.30. It's getting close to to um, the end of business day. Not that the FBI wraps up everything at 5 o'clock, clearly. Uh, the door bursts open and Agent White steps in. And he looks at the lab tech and points out the door. And she steps out very quickly. And he shuts the door. I don't know who your guy is out there or what he's trying to do. But if he's not one of the team, you need to make it real clear. Nobody comes into this office and tries to outspook us. Oh, you're right about that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk to him. He sort of gives the space, the three of you, uh, once over and then turns around, steps out. The lab technician steps back in. <laughs> sort of folds her hands in front of her lab coat and waits. Uh, thank her for her help. Let's go. I take the lab coat with me. Let's go see what Davis has gotten into and make sure uh, White hasn't thrown him into some sort of lockup. Yeah. That guy's on edge. I would like all of my agents in the field to make me a power roll. Yeah, 44 on an 85. A delicious 97 over 50. 55 under 65. I think I'll keep these dice. So I rolled a zero one. That's good for you. Very good. Just make a couple of rolls here. Talk amongst yourselves. So I will tell you this, Agent Taylor. We tie. And that's numerical tie. The group gathers together. You find Mr. Davis out, you know, working in, in some, some of the space, maybe heading back to the room. And uh, the, the group, the four of you meet back up in the hallway. Davis, you okay? Everything all right out there? Yeah, nothing I couldn't handle. Are you sure about that, Mr. Davis? Because it seems like you were caught doing something you shouldn't have been doing because we were cornered by our dear on-point, on-edge agent. So maybe an explanation now is good, so at least we know what it is we're dealing with. Oh, uh, sorry about that. I'm just digging, been digging up some information on uh, the archaeological groups. Yeah, let's take a break from their house, and once we have some more information, perhaps you can retry fishing for said information when it's perhaps a little later at night, when maybe our on-point, on-edge agent is in bed. So the agents are going to head where then? To the dig site? What I'd actually like to do is get the sheriff's information and give him a call before we leave the office and ask him to meet us at the dig site. And are you uh, are able to get in touch with a deputy out there. That's uh, Deputy Mark Tyler Brown. Deputy Brown tells you that he can meet you at the dig site if that's what you'd like. Deputy, if you could meet us at the dig site, I know that at least one of my people is going to want to take a look at stuff while we also get some additional information. So two birds, one stone. Yeah, it seems fine to me. What time of day will that put us out there? How much light will we have? Mm, October, probably 5.30, not a ton. You might have an hour of light at most. Oh. Do they have lights set up at the dig site? They do. Okay. Then we can go. Okay. You're going to head out to Big Porcupine Creek dig site, which we are going to see next episode. So I want to thank my cast of backers for stopping in for this, uh, this op, this Delta Green operation for all of you. And uh, we will get a chance to see what happens to them next time.